Hi, and welcome to the Racial Instructions podcast. From ancient Greece to branding, globalisation to Homer, and logic to fashion, we'll showcase a concise and dynamic insight into a range of diverse topics, or wherever your curiosity may lead you. So here is today's very short instruction. Hello, my name is Peter Holland, and I am the Lineker Professor of Zoology in the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford. I teach undergraduate students about the diversity, evolution and embryonic development of animals through lectures, practical classes and fieldwork. And I also run a research group where we try to work out how evolution at the DNA level relates to evolution of the whole animal. Before my current post, I was professor of zoology at the University of Reading, and it was teaching students in Reading and in Oxford and discussing this subject so much with students that gave me the enthusiasm to write this very short introduction. The title of the book is The Animal Kingdom, a very short introduction, and the central topic of the book is the evolutionary tree of animals. So what do we mean by an evolutionary tree? Well, think of it as a sort of who do you think you are of the animal kingdom? So who's related to whom? When most people think of animals, they might initially think of things like dogs and cats or birds and fish, but all those belong to one very small part of the animal kingdom, the vertebrates. That's the group of animals with backbones, and obviously they're quite familiar to us and we see them all around us. But animals are much more diverse than that. So those vertebrates that I've just mentioned, like the dogs and cats, birds and fish, they only account for about 2% of species of animal on the planet. Whereas the invertebrates, that's the animals without backbones, account for the other 98%, or I should say at least 98%, but it's probably a much higher percentage than that because there are so many invertebrates that we haven't yet described to science. And those invertebrates are incredibly diverse from jellyfish to centipedes, tapeworms to scorpions, sea cucumbers to giant squid. So in this very short introduction, what I tried to do is to survey that incredible diversity of animals, how it all arose in evolution, and then give a rapid tour of the biology of all the different major groups of animals. Thinking about what first got me interested in this subject is an interesting question. I think like many people, or many biologists, I always was interested in this. And in fact, I. I'd like to mention a very famous interview that took place between former US President Barack Obama and Sir David Attenborough a few years ago, in which Obama asked Attenborough, how did you get interested in biology and natural history? And David Attenborough replied to that question in a beautiful way. What he actually said was, every child is interested in the natural world. So the question should be, why do some people ever lose that interest? Now, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think I'm just one of those people that never lost that interest. So I started off interested in biology and I always have been. I've been interested in animals as long as I can remember. As a child, my bedroom was just like a zoo of fish and newts and cages of assorted caterpillars and silk moths and tanks of water beetles. And well, I'm still a little bit like that. I, I still get a thrill from watching badgers or seeing frogs born develop or catching moths at night. But I should also stress that biology is a very broad subject. And I think, like many biologists, I also get a thrill from those wider areas of biology. For instance, I get a thrill from looking at DNA sequences and for finding a new gene when we're studying the DNA of animals. So the main topic of the very short introduction to the animal kingdom centers around evolutionary trees. Now, that notion of a tree is a fantastic metaphor. And it's a metaphor which Charles Darwin used and Alfred Russell Wallace used and many others have used as well. And I think when we're thinking about evolutionary trees, it's good to envisage a picture of a real tree like an oak tree in your mind. And the way this metaphor of an evolutionary tree works is that all the different species of animal or indeed other living things would be placed at the ends of those twigs. When we want to understand an evolutionary tree, and we want to understand evolution, we want to see where all those twigs fit. Now, actually, that's a very complicated subject. And there's an interesting quote from Darwin in a letter that he wrote to Thomas Henry Huxley. And Darwin wrote, the time will come, though I shall not live to see it, 
when we shall have very fairly true genealogical trees or evolutionary trees of each great kingdom of nature. And I think that's a really interesting quote because Darwin is pointing out that this working out the who is related to whom should be possible, but it's a very, very difficult topic. And the answer took a very long time coming, and it certainly didn't happen in Darwin's time. But I think what I want to stress is that we now really do know the very fairly true tree of the animal kingdom. We pretty much know the shape of that tree. Now, I'm not going to say that we know where every twig fits, in other words, where every species fits, but we know the main branches. And I think that's a, a core change in our understanding of biology, that we know the shape of that tree. It's no longer a mystery. Evolutionary trees are no longer a mystery. And the reason for that is really DNA sequencing. We can use DNA sequences and the way that mutations happen in DNA to compare sequences between different species and work out who is more closely related or further away in those trees. And what's quite remarkable is that those new trees which have been built from DNA sequences have radically changed our understanding. It really is time to throw away the old zoology textbooks from 50 years ago or even from 20, 30 years ago and look again at who's related to whom. So why does it matter? Why do we want to know the evolutionary tree of, let's say, the animal kingdom? And I think the answer to this really is that an evolutionary tree allows us to make sense of the world around us. We just can't do that without a tree. Imagine if we want to think about why the body of an insect is divided into many segments or why the body of a worm is divided into many segments. We first need to ask the question whether insects are closely related to worms. Therefore, whether it's one question we have to answer or it's two questions we have to answer, it matters where they fit on the tree. And we could say the same for a biochemical property, a physiological process, a protein sequence. If we see these things, different species, we want to work out whether those features evolved once or twice or many times because that enables us to delve deep into the biology. So knowing the evolutionary tree makes it an exciting time to be a biologist because we can ask and answer key questions in biology. In addition, what I try to do in the very short introduction to the animal kingdom is take a whirlwind tour of all the major branches on that tree. So imagine the tree is a real tree. And what we're going to do in the book is go climbing along every major branch of that tree, look at the biology of those different animals. So I'll try and give a, a quick flavour of that. So in the basal branches, which is a little bit of an unfair term, actually, the branches that came off early in the tree would lead to animals such as sponges, jellyfish, and the beautiful comb jellies. These are all animals which don't have a clear head end, in other words, a front end and a back end, a left and a right. They have usually have more sort of radial or round type bodies without a clear front and back. But then the rest of the animal kingdom are what we call the bilateria. These are animals with a clear front end, back end, and they include animals which can explore the world in three dimensions. And I think that transition, if you like, the evolutionary step to having this bilateral body plan with a front end, back, left, right, top, bottom, was one of the most important steps in the history of our planet. Because once animals could explore the world in three dimensions, they could interact with each other in a very active way and interact with the environment and the substrate and change the whole ecology of the planet. Now, within the bilateria, the big group that I'm talking about, there are then three big branches. Unfortunately, they have three big names as well. So the first one is the Lophotrochozoa. That includes things like uh, the worms, the snails, uh, many other groups as well includes possibly the longest animal on the planet, a worm called Linnaeus longissimus, the heaviest invertebrate, the giant squid, and also many parasites as well. Then the next branch is the ecdysozoa. This includes things like arthropods, that's insects and spiders and centipedes and a few others, and the nematode worms. These are all animals that molt a cuticle. But interestingly, no one dreamt that the arthropods and the nematode worms fitted together on a branch of the evolutionary tree until the DNA evidence was analysed. And that comes back to a point I made earlier, which it was the DNA evidence and DNA sequences which led to this reshaping or, or new understanding of the evolutionary tree of animals. Now, with the arthropods, we know there are huge numbers of species. There's some interesting questions there. 
Why are there so many species of insects, for example? They really are the dominant animals by number of species and possibly by number of individuals too. And we can ask those sorts of questions, but they're not very easy to answer. Then the third of the large branches in the, in the evolutionary tree are the deuterostomes. This includes sea urchins, starfish, a group of fragile marine worms called hemichordates, which are rather smelly when you find them, um, some interesting marine things such as sea squirts and amphioxus, and the vertebrates fit in there, or those animals with, with backbones, mammals, birds, fish, etc. That's our branch of the evolutionary tree. So we really want to stand uh, from our perspective, from a human perspective, it's good to know where we belong in the evolutionary tree and to understand that our close relatives include things like those sea urchins, starfish and amphioxus. So I hope I've persuaded you that the evolutionary biology of animals is a fascinating topic, a topic where there's lots to discover and that you'll be keen to find out more about the incredible diversity of animals on the planet. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Instructions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher to receive new episodes directly to your podcast feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Music